So, you know, as we uh, get into 2015, uh, coming off of the brutality of 2014 and the brutality of 2013, the whole issue of technology and where our business is going has been challenged. They used to call it disrupt disruptive technology. I'm not sure what Casey's going to call it today, but it's clearly um, third parties are increasingly challenging what's going on in our business, how our business is monetized. And the underlying issue is what's happening with our rights, particularly when rights have been developed and uh, instilled in our legislative and regulatory areas uh, over many, many decades, uh, n never able to, and of course, how do you anticipate what's going to happen in 10, 20, 30 years? Um, we're in really capable hands here. Casey Ray of Future Music, who spends an inordinate amount of time studying these things, trying to figure out, scratching his head. That's why he's lost a little bit of hair here. Um, and he's going to walk you through what's a, a complex area, but perhaps one of the more essential areas, because this is what's going to set uh, not only our rights, but our ability to, to make a living in the future. So please welcome Casey Ray of Future of Music. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for trudging out in this weather. I'm from Washington, D.C. It's a couple of degrees warmer, so I'm going to be scurrying back to my city immediately uh, later in the afternoon to get warm. Um, Peter uh, mentioned disruptive innovation. I think we're calling it the Thunderdome now, officially, so you can write that down. It's a technical term that we use in Washington. Uh, I, my name's Casey Ray. I'm the uh, CEO of Future of Music Coalition. We're a 15-year-old nonprofit research, education, and advocacy organization for musicians and composers. We're based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm psyched to be back here at Jazz Connect uh, for what I know is going to be a fascinating conversation that will cover a lot of ground. Um, today we're going to look at jazz music and the concept of rights within the community. Some of these rights might be enshrined in law, uh, some may be more symbolic or expressive, and some are connected to the incredibly thorny world of copyright, and some are about promulgating the art form for generations to come and inspiring those new voices in jazz to become direct participants in its creation. So the reason that I'm here, uh, just as a quick bit of background, is that my organization embodies a very interesting set of intersections. We're an artist organization, um, including musicians, composers, music managers, but we also work a lot with the independent sector, independent uh, labels and so on and so forth. We're very much interested in the future. That's why we're called Future of Music Coalition. Uh, but we're interested in a future that's not dominated by one powerful agenda or another powerful, powerful agenda. Uh, we're also pragmatists, so we want to know how things actually work, right? And how creators are actually affected by whatever proposals that we're looking at. Because uh, the danger, if we don't know who we're talking about and can't articulate our needs, is that policy ends up being made by assumptions. And that can have a, a, a negative impact on all creators. So I'm, I'm really excited every time Future Music Coalition gets to participate in this conference, because I feel very much that you guys are our community. In our research and advocacy work, we always prioritize the so-called invisible genres, which isn't to say that these genres aren't valid or mighty in their way. It, it's just that the popular music marketplace, both in the industry and on the tech service side, doesn't often take into account the unique needs of folks who are, uh, who are highly specialized within the overall music ecology. Have, are, have in, any of you ever encountered our Artist Revenue Streams Research, Future Music Coalition's Artist Revenue Streams Research? Okay, great. So we did a, we did a big research project. I'm not going to get into it here. Uh, you can look at it on money.futureofmusic.org. Anyway, that study was very much designed to sort of capture data about the impacts of digital technology uh, over, over the decade uh, on particularly the jazz musician and composer community. And we do this type of work because, you know, how can you actually figure out how to articulate your rights if you don't know what you're experiencing and why? So anyway, our panel today is super brilliant. We're going to take a broad look at both the history of jazz and policy, but we're also going to drill down into the mechanics of the present and try to give some shape to a future where the jazz community is present and accounted for in terms of advocating for its own interests and using whatever tools and techniques are available for responsible promulgation. If we have any time left after that, we'll fix the rest of the music industry. 
So the panel we have here today is highly distinguished, uh, represents uh, a fascinating cross-section of expertise and experience. I'm going to make a couple brief, brief introdu in introductions for each, and then they can feel free to tell me what I got wrong after. Uh, if you want more information on their histories and backgrounds, you can check out their bios or talk to them after the panel. So to my immediate right, Mark Rabot, uh, personal hero of mine, um, acting president of the Content Creators Coalition, C3, which is an organization dedicated to winning economic justice in the digital domain for musicians, recording artists, composers, and other creators of cultural content. As an NYC-based guitarist, he's played on hundreds of recordings for artists like Tom Waits, Elvis Costello, T-Bone Burnett. Over 35 years uh, of his career, he's released over 20 albums under his own name on major labels and independent labels. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Uh, to Mark's right is Rachel Stilwell, who is an, an entertainment attorney advising musical artists, songwriters, and record companies on copyright, trademark, and publicity rights issues. She also advises filmmakers, producers, animators, graphic artists, writers, and actors on contractual and intellectual property issues. Before she became an attorney, Rachel had ex held executive positions with top recording labels and music marketing companies, including Verve Music Group in New York, where she ran Verve's multi-format radio promotional department, supervising all of the radio activities and promotional tours. She's also a published author and an expert on laws and regulations that impact musicians and copyright owners. Linda Lawrence Critelli is vice president of uh, CSAC's writer and Publ publisher relations. She's served CSAC and has been with CSAC since 1989. Her tenure with the company has allowed her to work with writers of all genres of music, but she has established herself in jazz, pop, and singer-songwriter formats. She's signed tons of up-and-coming writers as well as established professionals. Her roster includes some of the biggest names in music, including Bob Dylan, Neil Diamond, Rush, Mumford & Sons, as well as some jazz greats like Cassandra Wilson, Vijay Iyer, Jason Moran, and Greg Osby and lots of other legendary writers. Uh, Linda also ho hosts a showcase series here in New York City for unsized assigned talent, uh, develops uh, educational initiatives for CSAC affiliates, and I believe uh, is the president of the board of the uh, Recording Academy here in Former in president. Former president. trustee now. Gotcha. Uh, and before that, she was a professional singer, a uh, graduate of Berklee College of Music, where she was the recipient of their Distinguished Alumni Award. And last but not least, we've got Anna Tolenza, who is the Thomas K. Stecker Professor of Music at Georgetown University. Did I say K. Stecker right this time? Okay, more or less? Okay, good. Uh, she's published on a wide array of jazz topics, from its origins in New Orleans and reception in Europe, to its role in education and U.S. legislation. She's currently completing a book called Jazz Italian Style. In addition to Anna's scholarly work, she has served as a writer, a commenter for NPR's performance today, and published eight children's books, including Duke Ellington's Nutcracker Suite. So, very excited to have everyone here today. Uh, well, I'm just gonna, the way we're gonna do this is I'm just gonna put forward some questions and concepts, and you guys can jump in as the spirit moves you. Uh, so, what do you think we mean when we're talking about artist rights in general? Just the broadest question possible. Um, you had mentioned before that um, Future Music wants to have this discussion in which no, none of the, no um, single agenda dominates the discussion. And Content Creators um, Coalition would like two agendas, two powerful agendas to dominate the discussion. The people the musicians who make music and the people who consume it. How those two groups' interaction is mediated is usually called the market. And in the case of music, there are some very complicated state um, rules, compulsory licenses. It's a very complex situation. But as with all markets, it's shaped by a set of rules including the rights of the people who are creating things. Most basic of those rights is the right to own what you make. Now, this has been portrayed as a um, left-right issue very inaccurately. The right to own what you make can be described as a property right, but it's also the basic right of labor. If you don't 
own your time, then you're a slave. If you can't, people can bargain their time away, say, okay, I'll give away my time for X number of dollars. But if the basic right to own what you make, own your labor and the product of your labor is not guaranteed by law, and that law is enforced, you are a slave. And that's what, what we are being faced with today is a concerted corporate attack on musicians' basic rights. Yeah. Uh, just real quick, just to clarify, when I was describing uh, the, the universe uh, of folks that we care about, we care about musicians and fans as well. I'm more talking about corporate uh, large agenda interests that aren't always aligned with musicians. Sometimes they might be. So to be perfectly, um, to, to describe that with specificity, the mainstream music industry uh, does represent the rights of creators sometimes. Uh, the technology companies have l way less experience and way less interest in uh, advocating for musicians' rights, but they are platforms through which music is heard and get to the fans. So as Mark said, it's really, really, really messy, very, very complicated, and then there's a lot that needs to be mediated. But uh, we are very much uh, on the same page in the sense that it's about having a functional marketplace that serves creators and rewards fans' interest in music. If I could um, just step in a second. So I'm a, I, I teach uh, at Georgetown University, and we have an undergraduate program in American musical culture. So we're training. Um, there are students who perform, and we have you know, jazz, and it's an important part of, of learning how to perform it. But we also, most of our students want to go on and work in advocacy. They want to work for the government. They want to work in policy making. They want to be journalists. They want to sort of be a voice. And so um, I completely agree with you, Mark, about um, there is this mediation that happens between performers and audience members often. Um, and yes, the corporate world plays a big role, but so do other things. So the media plays a huge role. And you know, who are they sort of supporting? What side of the discussions are they on? Also the government. I mean, if we look at legislation, I mean, so now I'm being the, the, the academic who goes and looks at sort of a, a, a broad picture. If we look at legislation, the government, the United States government, really didn't get interested in jazz until it served a purpose. In 1950s, the Achilles heel, heel in um, uh, foreign policy was America's uh, race issues. And so jazz was first brought into legislation to send groups out to foreign countries to show, see America, we don't have a, a race problem. Look at all these African American jazz bands or look at these mixed race bands. So starting in 1956, you have that. The reason I bring that up that it's important, if we look at legislation, another thing that's really affected the way jazz is perceived in that is it something that should be preserved because it's important to our our, the history of our country, or is it a living art form that you know uh, is very much, has its own community that needs to be preserved? The reason I bring this up is legislation. If you look, changes. So a lot of times we talk about um, H. Conrad's 57 and uh, how you know the great things that it did to to promote music. In that resolution that happened in, in um, 1987, it was very much calling it a, a form of American art that was African American, that it came through African American art. If you look at later legislation, that gets taken out, um, and that it's something that is opened up to, to very many groups. The reason I say this is that affects the way corporations sell the music. We had race records as well, where you know, you're targeting a certain audience. So part of how we define the purpose of it and does it still exist? Is it still a living art form or is it something that needs to be preserved like a museum piece? I think that's also an important mediator that then in influences the corporate world. Rachel? Okay, so I'm the intellectual property lawyer and so what I do is copyright and trademark law and um, negotiate and draft deals. So from my perspective, Artists' rights have to do with the protection of intellectual property, um, in particular copyright, but also trademark and publicity rights as well. And um, and in the copyright world, you pretty much break it up into into two sections. One would be um, protecting copyrighted materials from infringement, and um, and then the right of the artist to make money from his or her works that, that he or she created. 
Um, so, you know, copyright is a bundle of rights. It's the, it's the right to copy, it's the right to distribute, it's, right, it's a right to sell, it's a right to change, um, it's a right to license. And um, each of those rights belongs to the copyright owner and that, uh, I mean, there are some compulsory licensing schemes out there, but it's uh, generally speaking the right of the copyright owner to do with his or her work what they want to do and, um, and uh, try to make money off of it. So, Linda, I, I wanted to get your take on this as well. Jazz is very much, um, you know, perhaps more than any other genre, known as being a, a really sort of progressive performance-driven medium, live performance. But then there's, you know, this amazing history of composition. And your work is going to touch on uh, the composition side and, and the performance of musical work. So can you tell us a little bit about how you see jazz music from your, uh, your perch? Well... Um, I work for CSAC, which is a performing rights organization, along with ASCAP and BMI. We are, there are three PROs in the United States, and we represent uh, really the songwriter, the composer, and the publisher, not necessarily the artist. Um, certainly in jazz, they're often, in most cases, the same person. So we're representing the compositions, and we're very interested and involved in all the issues that are going on that are taking place right now where our songwriters, our composers' music is being really um, used too freely, and we're all very aware of this subject, and I think that's probably what most of this audience wants to know, is how do we protect ourselves? Um, the first thing you can do um, to protect yourself and to learn about it, if you are a musician and you don't, you know, is, is join your performing rights organization and really stay on top of your business, set up your own publishing company and register all of your works. That's a really key thing to do as a musician. Your, your, independent music, your independent business owners, for the most part, the majority of the jazz affiliates that I work with um, don't have publishing companies, they are their own publishers, so they're responsible for taking care and collecting their own royalties. The PROs do a, 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 as good a job as they can in collecting uh, the majority of your rights, and uh, she was speaking about the bundle of rights that we all learn about in Copyright 101 class, but um, the, and the Performing Rights Organization will collect, they will collect some of your mechanical royalties through foreign societies, but not in the United States. I mean, that's something that you'll have to to manage yourself as a publisher. And we collect all the performance royalties um, for you in the United States. And then through our reciprocal agreements, we collect royalties from all the foreign territories too and disperse them to our affiliates based on the amount of performances that they have. And it's certainly no secret that the jazz genre of music, unfortunately, the dollars have just shrunk in America. Um, just, just dwindled down to just practically nothing, and um, there's a lot of reasons for this and a lot of discussion that we have in our business about it, and you know, basically it's that the radio, there's very few radio stations programming jazz music, and, um, and then there's, uh, there's just very, less and less outlets for your music to be performed in places that are actually paying royalties. Um, unless you're fortunate enough to get you know, great scholarships and grants, or uh, get composed for um, film and television. It's a challenging field. One thing we always promote is if you're performing live, and you were saying it is certainly a very live, uh, the, the jazz world is all about live performance. We have live performance payment system. CSEC was the first PRO to establish a live performance payment system in the United States. And you can thank CSAT because now ASCAP and BMI also have live performance payment systems. But you should know this as a, as a writer and as a publisher that you're responsible for taking care of your business, that you can actually submit performance forms to your performing rights organization and get paid for your live gigs. I mean, all the gigs that are happening this week, writers can get paid for their compositions being performed. And a lot of people don't realize that. So. My whole, um, really, my, my, my greatest passion is really to help my affiliates 
learn about their business and take care of it. And it's really kind of simple. It just means sitting down and learning a, a few little tricks, and it really can make a difference. Can now, you mentioned something, and, and, and I just wanted to bring it up or, or drill down really quickly, uh, because or not quickly, because I think there's a lot of people on the panel and, and myself that care about this. You mentioned that access for jazz artists to radio has been greatly diminished. Mm -hmm. Now, we know this because there's been tremendous consolidation in the commercial radio sector. My organization has research going back to the early 2000s about the impacts on that sector. But there's another reason why the economics around radio and jazz musicians in particular look so grim, and that is because performers on AM, FM radio in the United States, not songwriters or composers, are not able to collect money for that airplane. Oh, yeah. In pretty much every other part of the developed world, with the exception of Iran, North Korea, and the United States, basically, yeah. uh, this right exists. <clears throat> and Rwanda. Now, for US artists in the jazz genre, this is particularly acute, because you know, there are tremendous, amazing jazz composers, but jazz is also a medium where you know, the, it's, it's about performance. It's about, you know, maybe you did, John Coltrane did not write uh, uh, the, My Favorite Things, right? He, he performed that, and it's a legendary recording. Now, when that recording gets played anywhere else in the world, he, he as a performer or his estate is eligible to collect money from that. He can't do that in the United States. Worse, he's not eligible to get any of that money that's held on his behalf overseas because we don't have what's called a reciprocal right. I know that Mark's organization has uh, pushed on this, FMC, my organization has pushed on this. This is a very passionate issue for Rachel. Uh, Anna's interested, so let's just open that up and talk about, A, what will it look like if we put that, if we are able to magically implement a performance right for, for recordings in the United States, and how do we not disadvantage those smaller radio stations who are basically the only ones left who, who in the States who do play jazz? Um, yes, and, and this, just so you know, that this is not, this conversation is not really about magically. This is one of the items that we can hope to actually see legislation uh, uh, within the year. We hope to see actual legislation come out. And this is the key question. Um, I mean, I, I want to underline the importance of this reciprocity thing. Basically, all the con first of all, most jazz artists, we make our living touring internationally. We make our living primarily from live gigs, subsidized live gigs, by the way, in Europe, some in Japan. Now South America is starting to come up as a, as a, as a market for jazz. But um, that's where we make our money. And so when we play there, we get radio play. And we meet people and we play on their recordings. And their recordings get radio play. And Europeans who want to listen to American music tend to prefer jazz because it's not in a foreign language. It's instrumental, okay? So this reciprocity means that far, all these royalties collected by foreign radio stations, their governments will not allow them to pay them to us because our government does not pay their musicians when their tracks are played in the US. So in other words, there are big checks sitting out there um, for a lot of American musicians that we can't collect because, our, because we do not have a performance right for artists. Um, so this is a, a big issue and would greatly help many jazz musicians if there was a law. Now the last time this law came up, it was defeated because the National Association of Broadcasters uh, paid, created, I, well, okay, I don't have proof of this, but all of a sudden, there was a hugely powerful and well-funded organization of small, non-commercial radio stations. All of a sudden, they had access to huge funding and saying, this is killing, this will kill us, even though there were exemptions carved out for them. I can, I can actually tell you exactly what happened, because I was there. Um, basically, the National Association of Broadcasters is the, is the radio lobby. They represent uh, television and broadcast radio. Now, for years and years and years, they've been very effective at preventing a performance right from being enacted in the United States because they've got members, i.e. radio stations or affiliates, in all of the 50 states. Everybody has a local commercial radio station, and as long as they call it a tax, they can, they can whip that constituency into telling Congress not to do the thing. And so that they were very, very close. I believe it was 2008. Uh, they were very, very close to getting something over the hump. Uh, the National Association of Broadcasters wanted to mandate a 
uh, radio chip for your your phones. Now, I think that's a f perfectly fine idea. I don't think it's it's crazy. You, in, in other markets, you have that capacity already. Uh, you know, if there's a national emergency or some type of thing, local emergency, it's a good way to get over-the-air communication about uh, what's happening that's not based on the network. Well, that really kind of woke up the sleeping giant that is the Consumer Electronics Association, and there, there are many affiliates who were not interested in a technological mandate based on something that they hadn't been paying attention to, and so the bill was scuttled. So that's kind of like a, the insider view of, of what happened. Um, the, you know, this goes back to Frank Sinatra's era. He was beating the bushes for this thing. When, pe when I'm on panels and people ask me, Case, when is uh, performance right going to happen? I can now, I've, I'm now confident in saying, in my lifetime, uh, if only because when we're looking at the rest of quote unquote radio, and maybe we'll talk about this in a minute, internet radio, satellite radio, da da da, this glaring omission, the fact that performers are not paid for AM, FM play, is you can't fix the rest of that without addressing this fundamental imbalance. If, so if, I'll, if, I'll okay. be really brief, but, but just, just, just to, to finish. So we all have to be prepared for the propaganda is going to come out on this again. Uh, Content Creators Coalition and many others are going to be fighting for either exemptions or great discounts so that the stations have to pay little or nothing. I mean, we're talking, by the way, about maximums of, of several thousand dollars a year. We're talking about amounts that probably add up to about $10 a day. So that's for full-time music stations. So we're not talking about huge amounts. We'll be fighting for cutting those amounts in half. We'll be fighting for uh, subsidies for the stations that can't afford them. But it's hugely ironic that the National Association of Broadcasters, which is basically at this point Clear Channel, which has destroyed more local and jazz radio stations than any other force, is going to come out when this law comes out and say, oh, they're going to cry, oh, you're going to kill jazz radio. And, you know, we'll fight to minimize the effect. But, you know, I'm sorry, at a certain point, if you open a bakery, you got a budget for flour. Uh, if, if I can, I think there's an, a, a big elephant in the room, and it and it is tied to this as well. And that is when this legis when when early on it was decided that in the United States we weren't going to pay performer rights, we were going to pay composer rights um, uh, or recording rights. The 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 issue with it was also a state of mind of what jazz is. I mean, everyone in this room, we all appreciate jazz. We know what it is. We know how important it is, and we really understand it. But to people that, it, that haven't really had a strong connection with it, jazz is seen as sort of noodling around, improvising. You're just playing a piece. Uh, there's not an understanding of the, the true creative, if you want to call it compositional, if you want to call it intellectual engagement, um, of what it takes to create jazz. And so part of, of our ability, I think, to, in, to bring in legislation is, is we're also going to have to bring in some education. We're going to have to make sure that our congressmen and that our audiences or people we're trying to get as audiences have a real life experience of what that is. And that's not always going to be hearing jazz for the first time over the radio. So I do think that all of these things are interconnected. And so you know, in addition to uh, making sure that, that we have legislation that helps us get profits in all of the different ways that music is distributed, um, you know, th that recorded sound is distributed. Uh, I think we also have to think about creating a sustainable environment for jazz. And that means getting early on, it's going to take a generation, so that by the time you have legislature, legislators that go in, they've had an experience, a real life experience, a fascination with jazz. They have an understanding of what it is. And I think that's part of the problem, is if you just start talking legislation, to someone who hasn't had a deep comprehension of what jazz is, they just, they don't get it. And I think that's really important, and, and, I, and we'll, we're gonna open it up even further now, because obviously, the future of jazz is, is tied to you know, people actually being able to experience it. Um, when I was 16 years old, I went to a state university for jazz guitar. I was one of those kids that got to do a cool thing. And so I had an early kind of structured experience in, in this music, and that's why I've been like, you know, uh, fo you know, following everything that Mark's put out for the last however many years. But not everybody has that experience. How are people going to encounter this music? Me, as a person who's been a, you know, a musician, an engineer, and a music journalist, 
I benefit from this new world of access, right? So it's not just about radio anymore. I, uh, part of me just loves the fact that I can dial it up on my phone and be like, listen to an apocal jazz record that, you know, I, for some reason, may have escaped my, my investigation years earlier without really having to, you know, track it down or, or hunt for it or whatever. And, but the problem is the marketplace that allows that to happen is not designed to sustain the scale of creative uh, businesses that you know is, comprises the majority of jazz artists. So there's a conversation later today about streaming music, and I'm sure they're going to get into all of that there. But I just want to say, ask the panel generally: How do we balance the incredible importance of access to this amazing cultural and creative resource, this history, and also provide for its future? on any platform of access that we're talking about. And if you solve that, again, we can port that over to the rest of the industry and we'll be all set. I, I think there's a general consensus in the artist community that the royalty rates just need to come up both on the sound recording side and on the composer side uh, for both um, non-interactive streaming like Pandora and interactive streaming. Um, and, and what would you say to the counter argument if Spotify is like we're already paying 80% to rights holders, which is what they'll say? Okay, yeah, that's great when you're talking about on um, with respect to the percentage of your revenue, but on a per stream basis, that isn't really working for those of us in the artist community, and in particular with Spotify, that um, which is an interactive on demand streaming source. Um, there are plenty of people, including me, that think that to a certain extent that's cannibalizing record sales. And so if we're talking about trying to replace or better said offset some of the losses that we're suffering um, in the sales area, which is attributable in part to piracy and in part uh, to the replacement of sales by on-demand streaming, uh, okay, so, so Spotify, you've got to well, you've got to up your game in terms of what you're paying for for royalties because both for composers and for the owners of sound recordings, uh, and the recording artists, um, it's just peanuts. Not to be a ball hog here, but I wanted to do two things. First of all, I want to um, sort of demystify or de-jargon a little bit. If we're saying interactive, we're talking about services where you can go, choose the song. You can download it to a device for not permanent storage, but offline listening. You can uh, make mixes. You can share playlists. If you're talking about non-interactive services, they're radio-like services. Even if they're like algorithmically driven or tweakable to your taste, uh, they don't allow you that level of interactivity. Now, the, the real question here when we're talking about this is, one of them is probably, definitely, in my opinion, substitutional for sales, right? If I can download something to my device, send it to Mark over here who's on the service, make playlists and listen to it whenever I want, why do I need to buy a download or even a physical good? But the other side of it is, is more like the radio-like experience. And for the large portion of music listeners, and I don't have the perfect stats here, but I, I think it's a big portion of music listeners, that lean back experience is good enough, meaning this is that same universe of people who w turned on the radio and never bought an album anyway. So I, I, my personal question about this with all the smart minds that I talk to is, should we expect one side to subsidize losses on the other? Or how do you find that balance? Well, again, you know, the, the discussion started out with, with talk about d balancing the interests of different groups. And I want to come, and this question brings it back to that. But to de-jargonize further, what we're talking about here is, or correct me if I'm wrong, Casey, but the question you posed is how do we balance the desire of consumers to have access to my work against my need to be paid for that work, right? To bring it home. I think I have every Zotic record that you've ever played on on a physical disc. I don't listen to music that way anymore. Right, right. So, so how, are you you, how are you served? I'd like to turn that question around, okay? In other words, I'm producing a social good, something that is good if people have it, right? That's why we're presumably. I'd like to, to throw that question out to you and everybody else in the, in the audience, because what you do in your, in your day gig as director of the Future of Music Coalition um, 
is also a social good, right? That's a social good. So I'd like to say, how should we determine how you get paid? And for all of you out there, let's find out what, how you actually get paid for what you do, and let's have a discussion on how to balance that. And then let's vote at the end of this discussion on what it is. Because I think that people should, what you do is great, and I think we, if you made a third of what you make, we could afford three of you. I know. And that would be much better. Everybody agree? We voting on this now? You gonna take a third pay cut? Oh, maybe. A, a two-third pay cut? Like a oh, no, I'm sure it's tough. But we wouldn't be laughing if that, was, if that discussion was occurring in reality. It's occurring in reality for musicians. The question is wrong. The question is wrong. You know, like, I, and w when we did research into artist revenue streams, we found that, like, you know, not only are the, is the musician and composer community incredibly specialized and incredibly diverse, but we're all working, like, 50 different gigs. It's knowledge of craft. It's, like, live performance. It's, it's teaching. It's a million different things that we're doing. And I think my universe in the nonprofit world is, like, my people come, are coming from that same thing. Look, we're coming from the creative side, too. We're recording engineers. We record records at night. We master records. We mix records. You know, we book bands. We do all kinds of stuff. So, you know, it's very, very similar. It's like the creative community in general in this economic climate are income patchers. We're patching incomes from all over different places, and it's tough. I was hoping you wouldn't mention the, uh, the um, income stream study. I got a copy, because the income stream study is a very useful idea, um, but it's a very flawed study. I got my uh, I found out about it when I received a copy of the questionnaire from the American Federation of Musicians. The AF of M is the largest, not only the largest uh, distributor of the studies and largest respondents, but it comprises well over half of the answers. The AF of M, I'm a member, I'm a supporter. The American Federation of Musicians is in many ways a very productive organization. It does not represent mostly recording artists, okay? It represents people who play at weddings, it represents symphony players who rarely record, it represents uh, high school teachers who stay all over the country who have nothing to do with the recording uh, economy. And so these figures that it does, that the collapse of the record industry, that the attacks by Google and others on the record industry aren't really hurting so bad. Well, if you took the national figures, you would say that the collapse of the, rec of the auto industry didn't really hurt Detroit that badly. But if you go, because let's say the collapse of the record industry, of the auto industry only hurt Americans' income by 0.5%. But if you go to Detroit, you'll see a different story. And if you talk to actual recording musicians, you'll see a different story. People are hurting. And this study, which denies that fact, you have to a adjust for the flaws in, method in methodology. Think, uh, okay, so I'm gonna argue a little bit here. I, I, first of all, like, the study was, was actually what you see as a design flaw is actually something that we saw as a virtue in that we were trying to capture information about a broader class of musicians than had ever been in a sample set like that. And you have to start where you start. So conducting, creating a methodology of what questions you're gonna ask and promulgating that question to this impossibly vast community, how do you do that? You need your friends at AFM to help you circulate it, you need your friends at the PROs to help you circulate it, you need your friends at the Recording Academy to help you circulate it, you need your friends at the guilds to help you circulate it. And we're very proud at the, at the level of folks that responded to this because it actually was the first time anybody had actually asked those questions of this broader musician and composer community. Now, it, it's a different study if you look at the impact of the record industry. We didn't, on, on the recorded music industry. This survey was not designed to do that, but I agree that it would be very interesting to see similar methodology applied to the recording industry. So I don't know that it invalidates our survey. It actually probably proves the need for further research into a, an important subset of musicians. The original question, I think, had to do uh, something with, well, we've got a lot of competing different uh, interests from a lot of different organizations, and are they competing against each other uh, for the attention of legislators? Are they, uh, com are they com competing against each other for um, money and income? 
I, and I think um, that the answer to that question has been yes, and yet those of us um, in the recording industry are trying to change that. Um, in the last year or so, there's been an effort, um, in particular by a lawmaker here in New York, Gerald Nadler, to try to get some of the different factions, music publishers, um, the, you know, the RIAA, A2IM, um, you know, a lot of people whose interests overlap in many areas and are divergent in others, to try to come together and say, all right, instead of letting people like the National Association of Broadcasters divide and conquer us, let's stick together and try to get to legislators and get laws passed that are going to give all of us most of what we're looking for. Um, so there was an effort um, in the last year to try to put together an omnibus bill that addressed the, the numerous vast issues that Congress is looking at in their review of copyright law right now and, and will go, go forward in the, in the coming se uh, congressional session. Um, you know, I don't know whether, for example, the performance royalty bill that we can expect will be part of an omnibus bill or whether it will be separate, but we can expect something. Um, and I, and um, you know, bills come and go, but I think there's an effort among the varying organizations to try to stick together. And as you can tell from the lively conversation that's happening here, um, a lot of times different organizations and different people um, who are um, well versed in this stuff uh, agree to disagree. And so, so for example, Casey and I agree on the subject of performance royalties and differ on issues, uh, for example, on how best to combat piracy. Um, but, but with the organizations, we're, we're, we're trying to get to legislators, which in, in frankly a nonpartisan fashion, in a time when Congress can agree on nothing, you have lawmakers as diverse as Democratic Gerald Nadler here, and Daryl Issa and uh, Bob Goodlatte for, on the Republican side, joining together and saying it's really important to protect intellectual property, protect copyright, be able to make money off of your copyright for entirely different reasons. So the Democrats are saying arts make the world a better place and we have to reward creators. And Republicans are saying, uh, you know, that this is money and we want to keep jobs here in the United States and it's all about, you know, it's all about the dollars. Yeah, I want to hear from the other side. Of, that's awesome. I want to hear from the other side of the table real quick. And it is really hard to, 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 to find that balance and I think that it's good that, that uh, folks are starting to hear that there is a balance to, to be struck and the right people are, are getting involved. Well, I'll just also mention another bill that was uh, proposed last year uh, called the Songwriters' Equity Act of 2014, which was... <clears throat> brought forward by a very uh, Republican congressman out of uh, Georgia. And um, <clears throat> he's a junior congressman. He doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of weight, unfortunately. But at least he proposed it. And the music industry has embraced him as our uh, potential savior <laughs> to at least bring it forward. It's very challenging. I think one thing that hasn't been brought up is I, I've done a, a bit of lobbying in Washington, D.C. And, and also in Albany in New York for, for New York issues. And it's interesting when you do sit down with our, our elected leaders and you share with them the story and, and, and we bring, um, I, I'm very involved with the Advocacy Committee of the Recording Academy. So if you're looking to get involved with uh, some lobbying group or some effort, it, you can certainly look at the L Recording Academy and join our efforts um, on, on the Advocacy Committee. Ben Allison and myself are, are very involved with that. And we'll be making trips to uh, Albany this year, <clears throat> working on some a music production tax credit for New York State. But um, back to the Songwriters Equity Act, um, you know, this is something that uh, I think is is uh, everyone agrees upon. And when when we go and we do talk to these legislators, you know, they're. They, they get it. They get it when we say to them, hey, listen, you know, our livelihoods, the people in our industries, their livelihoods are in jeopardy here. We need, we need you to come forward and to support us. You know, meanwhile, they were supporting 
the NAB, you know, a month earlier. The, the, the NAB is a much larger, they have so much more money than the industry, the music industry. And one thing I've learned too about lobbying, when we go to New York or whether we go down to Washington, is they're like, come back. Come here, why aren't you here? I mean, the NAB has got some guy down there every freaking day knocking on the doors. We're not there enough. The Recording Academy has one day that we do. It's called Grammys on the Hill. It's in April. Beautiful, effective day. But I wish we could spend more time and, and had the, the money. And unfortunately, it's, you know, we don't have a lot of money. We don't have... You know, we haven't all come together to pitch in to keep lobbyists. I mean, CSAC has a lobbyist, ASCAP and BMI have a lobbyist. We all have our own little independent lobbyists, but we don't have the force that the, the radio stations have to combat the performance bill. It's not even a bill right now. What a shame, because that, that single-handedly could really make a huge, huge difference in people's pockets. And not just in jazz, across the board. And we go there, and when we go there, we're not talking about one specific genre of music. We're talking about all creators, all music levels, because it will trickle down. It's got to be vast. It's got to encompass every genre of music. Yeah. Hey, because that's I, where the big dollars I are. I would love, Anna, to make a couple of quick comments, or just a quick comment. I, we might have time for, like, two questions, but they'd have to be super fast. Well, no, the only thing I was going to say is um, I completely agree with you and lobbying makes a huge difference but you know a lot of what we've been talking about today has been national legislation and you also have local legislation and so part of it I would say is you we've got to build audiences even if you're representing all if jazz does even show up on the list then things that pertain specifically to jazz just won't be thought about in when they're looking at you know someone like Katy Perry or something, I mean, just with the numbers and everything else. So the thing I would say about jazz is think about your local community. In New Orleans, after Katrina, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary, um, there was all of this, you know, people were investing and they were rebuilding. And it's true, the buildings are back and some of the, you know, venues are back up, but you also have a lot of people who came in who paid to restore all various neighborhoods. And then they didn't like it when there was music in the streets after 10 o'clock at night. So there's been local legislation in New Orleans to ban music after 10 o'clock at night outside in some of these neighborhoods. That's going to kill what is, you know, the music industry, the music world of New Orleans. So part of this is about, I think we have to get involved locally. Because if we get involved locally, representatives will hear it from our region, they will go to Washington. So as, a, as opposed to trickle down, I would say we need to trickle up. We need to make the local communities work and then build. That's a great point. Uh, so uh, can you go up to the mic real quick? You can. Unfortunately, I knew this was going to happen. We have so much we could talk about and it could go on forever. Well, uh, maybe specifically to Mark, but everybody, I just would like to walk away with a to-do list, especially regarding this issue of the fact that media companies, it's, it's not in their best interest to pay us at all. In fact, it's the very opposite. It's in their best interest to sell advertising, and jazz will never do that. So I'd, I'd like for anybody to recommend something that we as musicians can do to further um, all the great um, work that you all are doing. Can I just say a very simple thing you can do is look at ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC's websites because we're keeping our affiliates up to date on these current issues and asking you to sign on to certain things, petitions and such, and that will keep you abreast of what's going on. Um, and I know there's a ton of other websites and places that you can go to get this information, but to stay current on current topics. Yeah, we have a petition up at the Content Creators Coalition uh, New York website on the artist, uh, on the performance royalty issue. We're going to be acting on it. So my advice is, if you're a, if you're a musician, join, join C3. Um, if and for anybody, visit the website. Unfortunately, the national website is down. It should be up in a couple of weeks, and we will be posting other petitions and holding other events. And become involved. Act, show up if we're if we're uh, doing events because we need to let we need to let the legislators know that people care. Do we want to? We, do we each give one more idea? Yeah, give your okay. Contact your congressman um, if you can educate yourself about the issues, and we've only touched on a, a few of them here. It, you know, for jazzers in particular, it includes other things like federal protection of pre-1972 recordings. We haven't even like hit that here, but you know, in the jazz world, that you know matters. So um, uh, you know, so 
Um, the, the PRO website's uh, Recording Academy Advocacy is a good source of information. Um, it, the lively conversation that we've had here may indicate it might be best to get your information from more than one organization and then contact your congressman and, uh, or congresswoman and let them know how you feel and what you want. And finally, I would say, let's not think about jazz just sort of as a, as a sound or even just an art form, but we could compare it to the environment. It's not something we can fix in a year. It's gonna take a generation or two. So we're gonna need to realize that what we're trying to fix, it might be for the next generation, so we need to get them involved. So go talk to a kid and get them turned on to jazz. Uh, Jason, as you know, as we've been discussing today, terrestrial radio pays nothing for sound recording, so the artists get nothing. But digital radio, Pandora and Sirius, Pandora and Sirius do pay uh, for playing sound recordings, which is great. They pay sound exchange. 50% goes to the artist, 50% goes to the labels. It's a great system. Now, you're aware that there are various lawsuits now uh, filed by Flo and Eddie on behalf of the Turtles and the RIAA that Sirius and Pandora are are not paying for pre-72 sound recordings because the federal law doesn't apply to them. Now the decisions that have come down, which are incredibly exciting, in both California and New York state, not only that Sirius and Pandora should pay for pre-72 sound recordings, the rulings in these cases say that under the law of California and under the law of New York, sound recordings have public performance rights. So. These cases are both going to be appealed, but what impact do you think that they'll have, and what do you think the, uh, the, the future is? I'm gonna grab that real quick, just because it's very complex, but Bedrock, pay pre-72 artists, full stop. Everybody that, uh, where you're performing music by somebody and there's an artist, pay them. That's just what you do. Uh, the question is, you know, and this is where it gets creepy and inside baseball, I've literally sat, and I'm probably gonna get thrown in the back of a black van for saying this, but I don't care. Um, you know, I've literally sat across the table from major record labels who oppose not only partial federalization of pre-72s, but are still, to this day, uh, against full federalization, i.e. the full suite of rights that would be afforded and protections and exclusivities that would be afforded to uh, our legacy performers. And I think that's tragic. Now, the, the really interesting question is these legal cases. If on a state-by-state -state basis it is determined that that performance right is broad enough, it could very well impact venues, radio stations, and so on and so forth. So in terms of a legislative conversation, it's really a question of do you do something and can you pass something in the interim uh, you know to extend performance rights to this narrow category because there were no remember the, this all goes back to the simple fact there is no federal con uh, copyright for music that was recorded before February 15 1972 you recorded on February 16 you're all set which is insane but you know the question is uh, do you move forward with a legislative vehicle and can you pass a legislative vehicle that will do a narrow extension of performance rights to pre-72s or can you go for the whole package for many reasons including the ability to recapture your rights under a 35 year termination provision and a thousand other things including uh, piracy protections and so on and so forth I wish they could do the entire thing the full the full, uh, you know, bringing all the pre-72s into uh, the federal copyright protection universe. Now, we're looking at a million things in a potential copyright law review, right, Rachel? So it's like, the yeah. question is, what do you do first and how do you make this happen? Okay, so um, what Casey just said had like 18,000 different things going on <laughs> at once and, um, and it's, it's pretty difficult to parse out, but I'll just focus in on a, a little bit of it. Um, yeah, we, we want 1972 sound recordings to be protected, but for somebody, for me, um, it, it really is important to make that federal protection, which doesn't exist right now. And the reason is that under state law, you can't get into federal court and sue for statutory damages and attorney's fees. From a practical consideration, that means that those things, unless you're Flo and Eddie, I suppose, are uh, you can't go litigate because it doesn't make financial sense to go into court. Um, it's more expensive than it's worth. If you have federal protection, then uh, for non-willful infringement, um, damages are up to $30,000 per work plus attorney's fees, which really, really matter. And because um, nobody wants to pay their own lawyer, I know. And 
Um, and for willful, uh, for willful infringement, it's up to one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars per infringed work. So, um, if you, and damages are hard to prove in a in a copyright case. So, having pr federal protection instead of state protection of, of pre nineteen seventy two recordings is crucial. Okay, we got to wrap it up. Uh, Peter came over and tapped me on the shoulder, but thank you so much, guys, for a very spirited and lively conversation. And thank you. Sorry we didn't have time for more questions, but we'll be here for a few.